Hi, I'm Nelson Spruston, and this is Eric Bloss. We are here in Bob's Pub at Genelia. Yes, we spend a lot of time at Bob's, whether this is a uh, coffee before the day starts or a beer at the end of the day to catch up on some of the latest news. It's all about shared interests and shared experiences, and this is such an important part of life. We remember these experiences, where we were when something cool happened, who we were with, and our memory of those events is really important to us because it forms a record of our lives and we learn from them and it influences our future behaviors. A long time ago when I was in college, I learned about the hippocampus and the importance of the hippocampus in forming these kinds of memories. And ever since, I've been fascinated by trying to understand how the hippocampus works. This paper is also about the hippocampus, so let's go over to the next room where there's a nice picture of the hippocampus on the wall and we can start to talk about the science. This is a beautiful drawing of the hippocampus, which was made by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. The focus of the study we're talking about today is the CA1 region, and the principal type of neuron there are these CA1 pyramidal neurons. These have extensively branching dendritic trees, and they are decorated with thousands of synapses. Many of those synapses are excitatory. The majority of them begin over here in the CA3 region, and the neurons over here send their axons into CA1, forming excitatory contacts onto much of the dendritic tree. There is a second excitatory projection that comes from the entorhinal cortex by the perforant path. And you can see that this pathway is restricted to the more distal part of the apical dendritic tree. Now there's an additional element to the integration of synaptic inputs in these neurons, which is that there are, is a whole host of inhibitory interneurons. Cajal has drawn a couple of them in here. Here's one over here, for example. And these neurons, are their synapses onto the pyramidal cells, are the focus of the study that we're talking about today. Despite the fact that we know there are maybe 20 or so cell types in area CA1, we don't really have a clear understanding on how this cellular diversity translates to circuit function. We know from cable theory, for example, that the precise location of an inhibitory synapse on the dendrites can strongly influence how the dendrites integrate excitatory input. So a relatively straightforward and simple question that we wanted to ask was whether there was any structure in how the distinct cell types actually target the branches of CA1 pyramidal cells. Now recently, there's been a generation of several transgenic mouse lines that has given us genetic access to these subsets of interneurons. We engineered these cells to express a specific tag that we could then visualize so we could see where their axons contacted the dendrites. However, synaptic connections are tiny in comparison to the size of the dendritic tree of a pyramidal cell. So what we really needed was to use an imaging modality where we could image high resolution and large volumes. In fact, we needed something higher resolution than most traditional forms of light microscopy. So for this problem, we turned to array tomography, which is a relatively novel imaging technique uh, developed by Stephen Smith and colleagues to answer this type of question. So let's take a short walk down to the electron microscopy facility where I can show you how we implemented this process in our study. The basic idea of array tomography is to prepare your tissue samples for electron microscopy and cut them into serial ultra-thin sections. Here I'm sectioning a piece of mouse brain that's been resin embedded and I'll collect all of these serial sections on a glass cover slip. And then we stain these cover slips for fluorescent antibodies that recognize synapses, axons, and dendrites. This is the array tomography microscope. Where we're now collecting images from those serial section ribbons that we collected off the ultramicrotome. It's more or less a conventional light microscope, except that we've added some autofocus software and hardware, which enables us to go back and retake any images that come out that are not perfect. At each location, we'll collect several fluorescent channels, which correspond to synaptic, axonal, and dendritic signals. Once we've collected all these images from a typical array, they are then computationally stitched back together to produce a seamless volume of the CA1 microcircuit. So in terms of the analysis of our array tomography data, we first broke the dendritic tree into specific domains and branch types. And what you're looking at here is a movie uh, with primitive cell dendrites in green. These are terminal tuft branches and the corresponding axons from a specific set of interneurons shown in red. And the specific question we are interested in is whether these axons contacted the branch at locations close to the branch point or close to the branch tip. And what we found was that different types of interneurons prefer these locations on the branches. To make sense of these data and to understand the potential implications, we created a computational model where we could move around synapses to determine how their location affects the integrative properties of the dendrites.
Eric's data really nicely attests to the fact that different types of inhibitory interneurons project and target different locations within the CA1 pyramidal cell dendrites. We've got a lot of really nice tools that we can use to investigate the type of the effect of cell type specific inhibition. At left and right shown here are two models where we have this excitation, but this excitation is occurring in conjunction with two different types of inhibition. On the left hand side here is inhibition that Eric has observed that's primarily targeting the distal dendrites shown here. The second type of inhibition is primarily targeting the more proximal location of the tuft. And when the same excitation is played in with the second type of inhibitory input, we see that the largest depolarizations occur not in the proximal tuft like we saw in the previous simulation, but rather towards the more distal tips. And indeed, these large depolarizations are quenched as one moves more proximally through the dendritic arbor. Our array tomography results provided strong evidence that different types of dendrite targeting interneurons form their synapses on different branch types of the pyramidal cells and specific locations on that branch. When we examined these distributions using a computational model, our results showed that each dendrite targeting interneuron type might help drive a specific type of computation in the pyramidal cell. Since the diversity of dendrite targeting interneurons is a hallmark of cortical circuits, we think this will apply to other areas of the mammalian brain as well. Eric and the rest of the group did a fantastic job executing an extensive series of experiments and computational analyses. With Rick Fetter's help, I was able to collect multiple rounds of several thousand uh, sections for array tomography, and he was also instrumental in helping the correlative ATTEM studies, where we could show definitively that synapses in the light level were also synapses at the TEM level. Jennifer Colonel built the array tomography microscope, and Bill Karsh helped with the alignment to computationally stitch all these tiles together and produce seamless volumes of CA1. Mark Sembrowski helped with the computational model, and the implications from the model were very important for our work. This kind of teamwork exemplifies the approach that we like here at Genelia, which is groups of people working together to tackle important problems. And what we found in this study is exciting. Somehow, these different types of inhibitory interneurons are able to find and form synapses very precisely onto their dendritic targets. The cell biological processes by which this happens are completely mysterious, but we think it's likely to be very important. And this will ultimately affect the integrative function of these neurons, the computations they perform, and the computations of the circuit itself, which contribute to the formation of new memories and the storage of those memories. Please check out our paper online to find out more.